Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Economic Rockstar Podcast. In this week's episode, I speak to James Kenneth Galbraith, who is the Lloyd M. Benston Jr. Chair in Government and Business Relations and Professor of Government at Lyndon B. Johnson School of Business Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. James was Executive Director of the Joint Economic Committee of the U.S. Congress in the early 1980s, and he chaired the Board of Economists for Peace and Security from 1996 to 2016 and directs the University of Texas Inequality Project. He is a Managing Director of Structural Change and Economic Dynamics. From 1993 to 97, he served as Chief Technical Advisor to China's State Planning Commission for Macroeconomic Reform, and in 2016, he advised the presidential campaign for Senator Bernie Sanders. In 2014, he was co-winner with Angus Deaton of the Leontief Prize for Advancing the Frontiers of Economics. James has written a number of books, some of which include Welcome to the Poison Chalice, The Destruction of Greece and the Future of Europe, Inequality, What Everyone Needs to Know, and The End of Normal, The Great Crisis and the Future of Growth. And for those of you who aren't aware, James is the son of the late John Kenneth Galbraith, a renowned economist, public official and diplomat. And in this episode, we discuss James's views on the teachings of mainstream economics today, his work on inequality, democracy, the financial crisis of 2008, and the impact it has had on Greece, as well as, of course, his late father, John. So make sure you check out all the links, books, and resources mentioned here in this episode with James over at economicrockstar.com forward slash James Galbraith. That's G-A-L-B-R-A-I-T-H. And if you want to support the show, make sure you subscribe and listen if you're listening on Apple Podcasts. That way you'll never miss a, an episode. As well as subscribing or listening on other podcast platforms. And don't forget, if you can, share and like and review. And for those of you who are more inclined to support the show financially, why not check out my Patreon page over at patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar in which you can actually support the show for as little as one dollar a month so as always thanks very much for joining me press and play and for listening to my conversations with some of the best economists out there and it's always much appreciated so enjoy this episode with professor james kenneth galbraith james welcome to the economic rockstar podcast thank you Good to be with you. I'm very blessed to have you and looking forward to um, talking to you about you and your work. And I suppose, uh, if you don't mind, we get cracking on your background on how you actually found economics, because I know you have a, a nice lineage there. And is this an influence that your father had brought to you or did you discover it in other ways? Oh, it was a, an act of teenage rebellion, naturally, because my father was one of the great uh, economic uh, dissidents of his era. So I decided I would have to actually study the subject. And when I did, I discovered he was right. So the rebellion fizzled. But there, then I, at that point, I was stuck in the profession. Because I can imagine any young kid growing up and they're under pressure from if a father or mother who are highly intelligent in terms of a medical profession or in science and they'd like to pass on that type of knowledge or encourage no, no, your kid no, not, to go the right not way? At all. Not at all. Uh, they, my father, first of all, you, you have to bear in mind that he grew up on a farm. Yeah. Uh, and so his general view was that anything that did not involve uh, steering a plow and staring at the back of a team of horses was improvement. Uh, but beyond that, he was also, uh, as he uh, developed his career and reputation, acutely aware of the power hi hierarchies and uh, that uh, the true power in American society rests with lawyers rather than economists. So he was quite pleased when my oldest brother became a lawyer. But the rest of us, the two younger ones, Peter and myself, who followed in his footsteps as a diplomat and an economist, he thought, well, OK, that's that's acceptable at, at some <laughs> level, but it is not certainly the, the, the best thing one could have done. Oh, my God. Wow. Um, because I and you you read about his work earlier on and you found out that he was somewhat a dissident to the mainstream economists out there. This was obvious from the time I was very small. But was it? Oh, sure. I mean, in the sense that, that the, 
that when I was six years old, he published The Affluent Society, yeah. which uh, remains one of the uh, perhaps the leading uh, uh, critique of the uh, of the mainstream economics of the age. And uh, and that book is dedicated to me. So I'm, I'm stuck with the uh, with the association from from a very early age. Yeah, uh, just to be even to be tuned in at that early age of what was going on with. Um, well, I'm not going to say that at six years old I was aware of this, but you know, it's a it's the milieu you grew up in. And that must have been very difficult to be as you grew as you got older to be aware of the criticisms, perhaps that your father was um, exposed to, but also the support that he had garnered, especially when he worked for the, the presidents, a number of presidents. So now, he was it, doing, it, definitely doing things right. Let's, yeah, let's be honest; it wasn't difficult at all. Uh, I had a, an, an opportunity growing up to be, uh, uh, you know, in the center of a great many interesting things. Uh, and some dramatic things, including the opposition to the war in Vietnam, which really did his leadership of that movement in the 1960s was a defining part of my adolescence. Uh, but no, I mean, they, they, I, 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 I can't uh, state for a second that there were difficulties associated with this. It was all in the in the realm of 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 really high privileges and, and great advantages, which I try to take it, you know, to, to, uh, 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 to live up to, but that's <laughs> to say that it was difficulties would be the opposite of the truth. People who's, who have to start from scratch, who have to make their way up from, uh, from, from, uh, you know, as my father did from essentially humble origins, they face difficulties. People like me, no. Yeah. And what, what was it like growing up? You, you weren't in that farming community any longer than, no, no, no. My father uh, was uh, came to Harvard University in 1934 and returned as a essentially as a tenured professor in the late 1940s. So that was all before I was born. I grew up in an academic household in a, in in Cambridge, Massachusetts, at the peak, at the peak of its prestige. By the way, as the center of the of the uh, of, of of the intellectual life of the United States. So your formative years would have been based on your, you know, as you said, when you were a teenager, you became a bit of a dissident and read your father's work and then realized actually he or a rebe rebellious in a way. And you read his work and you found out that he was actually correct. So those formative years were exposed you to economic yeah, argument I, and independent I thinking. I don't want to get into the rebellion stuff too much. I said that somewhat facetiously. Yeah. No, no, we were all very... Uh, very proud of my father's role, both as an economist and as a uh, leader of the opposition to the war in Vietnam, which was the great social movement, political movement of my adolescence. So mm. there was no point at which I was in, uh, uh, in real rebellion. But I did say facetiously that uh, uh, that uh, actually going at you know at the age of uh, in my early twenties to uh, to to study economics at the graduate level uh, to take a PhD in the subject uh, did require that I spend a, a, f a few years or at least in a way a few months absorbing the mainstream orthodoxies to which my father was had already offered the dominant critique so th th there was I won't say that I was ever attracted to those orthodoxies uh, mm -hmm. but I did realize that I had to pass I had to pass muster in that those circles before I could be uh, take on the, the mantle of a of a professional economist, economist myself. And do you think it's important for economists to help nurture and mature their thinking? Is it important to read this work by other economists, especially the mainstream? Uh, I discourage students from taking advanced degrees in economics at this juncture in the life of the discipline because, in my view, there really has not been any significant or interesting intellectual development, anything really is worth the time uh, over the since the maybe late 1970s, early 1980s at the at the latest. Uh, and so it, it, we're looking at a discipline which is uh, at the mainstream level, largely stagnant, uh, hermetically sealed upon itself a set of of scholastic exercises. Very few members of the profession uh, have any useful role in, in public policy, certainly in the United States or in Europe, uh, other than uh, they get positions at, in you know, advisory bodies like the, or central banks and things of that nature. But they're not really playing 
a, a uh, contributing to the let's say to the governance of the country in any significant or constructive way. So my 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 view at the moment is that that the economics profession needs a very radical uh, makeover reform or more essentially that it should be de-emphasized by universities so that uh, more useful and productive fields can be uh, can come to the fore. So what next for the economics discipline then in academia? Well, it's you know they, they, we we have uh, around the world in various places monasteries that continue to harbor monks uh, and that have uh, traditions that have not changed since the Middle Ages uh, and economics uh, academic economics is by way of becoming a very similar phenomenon. Uh, a, a group of, of, of self-involved people hold up on a on an isolated mountain and, and, and cut off out of con- out of contact with the rest of the world. The only difference difference there is that the that the monasteries tend to cultivate uh, important artistic achievements, uh, or else they continue to make very good brandy. Uh, and I don't see either of those things in the uh, in, in developing out of academic economics. So if we have to continue teaching economics or even reading or studying economics, um, we are going about it the wrong way in terms of what's being taught. Because say, for example, uh, I, I know personally that we're quite restrictive in terms of the curriculum and it's mostly Keynesian or you get the, some monetarist uh, economic thinking as well. There's very little Keynes. You cannot find Keynes on a on on a a uh, graduate level curriculum, I would think practically anywhere uh, in certainly in the United States. And I would be surprised in Europe other than in a handful of uh, courses of a handful of people who have uh, who are distinctly on the fringe of the discipline. Keynes, who was the dominant uh, theoretical economist of the mid 20th century, has been practically read out of the uh, uh, of the curriculum. There are the word Keynesian is still used uh, but it is a faint and highly uh, unrepresentative, distorted picture of Keynes himself, and it completely bleeds out the important critique that Keynes made of the of the thinking of his time. Uh, and uh, so, the, I I would uh, really take exception to the idea that Keynes, that Keynes's ideas uh, remain uh, um, uh, importantly represented. One of the problems is that precisely that they don't. Uh, and one could go and look at the other significant uh, innovative figures of the past two centuries and you will find the same phenomenon there's no good representation of marx or for that matter of schumpeter uh and i could go give you a list of others who who should be in the curriculum and who by and large are not yeah it's something that i find in this podcast when i speak to academics or authors that we we tend to i'd like to explore these other types of economic thinking that may not be on the curriculum where we are not given a chance to branch out or be able to teach them because we're restricted. Uh, and it's only through academics who are maybe tenured that they decide to be, have the freedom, that they can have the freedom to write about other stuff uh, in their books. Yeah, academics who are worth the name have freedom to teach what they think is important. Uh, but of course, junior academics uh, feel constrained by the pressures of uh, getting the approval of, of of their senior colleagues in order to get promoted, uh, and so that tends to limit their willingness to be adventurous. Uh, and senior academics, by the time they are promoted, have lost the, have largely lost that sense of adventure if they ever had it, mm-hmm. uh, or have been selected precisely because they don't have a sense of adventure. Uh, and so one can one can name the. Um, I would think the intellectually inquisitive and adventurous senior economists, uh, one could number them on the fingers of a hand or two. Uh, and many of those are uh, you know, now approaching what in another discipline would be retirement age. Would you think there, this kind of goes on in journals as well, where you have gatekeepers in terms of the editors that restrict what gets published? Well, there's a, yeah, there's a there's a, a a depressingly strict hierarchy of prestige rankings amongst the journals, a very uh, tight uh, and kind of tribal relationship uh, between the editors, their proteges, their colleagues, and so forth. Uh, so the system is very much self-protective and self. Uh, 
regenerating. And, uh, you know, for example, I've been told I'm not a member of the economics department at the University of Texas at Austin. I uh, made that decision. Well, it was a mutual decision strategically many decades ago. But uh, I've been told by uh, people who are uh, in that department that uh, in order to be considered for an appointment there, you have to have published in a very narrow list of what they consider sort of top 10 journals. Are they really top 10? I would say no. I would say they're no better than other journals and they are often much less interesting than other journals. So if your work is, is, is specialized, if it's, uh, if it has a intellectual, uh, let's say a, an eclectic intellectual Origin, if it's what we call heterodox, uh, you would tend to publish in in in, in some, one of the many specialized journals and automatically disqualify yourself for an appointment in, in that department. And that's true of, I think, generally speaking, of mainstream economics departments. So it's as I say, a very self-enclosed world, uh, and that is not conducive to the role that the economics profession, in my view, ought to be playing, which is that of of providing a forum for a wide-ranging discussion and critique of the uh, systems under which we live and of the problems uh, that uh, economic society actually faces. And that goes right up to the Nobel Prize as well, because there are critics of, and I, sorry, you know, for, it's just the way the conversation you, is going. You're, you're, you're referring to the Bank of Sweden Memorial Prize in, Mem- Prize in Memory of Alfred Nobel, which is sometimes referred to as the Nobel Prize. Uh, correct, yeah. It is not the Nobel Prize. It is a prize that goes alongside the true Nobel prizes. It's awarded by the by the by the Central Bank of Sweden, uh, and according to the views of the economists who happen to be in that institution, uh, sometimes the uh, award is to people whom I uh, like and admire. Sometimes not so much. So it's a, but it's certainly not a, uh, let's say. A marker of the of relative prestige in the same way that the Nobel prizes in in physics or chemistry or medicine or the Nobel Peace Prize has been. I think it's important to have um, prizes there to reward academics, especially or even economists, especially if they're challenging orthodoxy or heterodox models or. Um, just exploring different aspects of the economy, maybe through human psychology, because I know your father, as you referred to a book earlier on at the beginning there, um, he, he wrote a book about the affluent society and that became a very much a, a good seller later on. I think it was in the mid nineties again, or people found it in 2008, just around the time of the crash that he had picked up ideas about people's psychology. Even in the Great Crash of 1929, that book too. Well, the Great Crash of 1929 has uh, practically never been out of print since it was first published in 1955. I would argue that the that the affluent society, the Great Crash, the New Industrial State, and one earlier book, American Capitalism, uh, formed a a, a broad, coherent vision, a, a grand, let's say, portrait of the economic life of the country in the period that they described. The Great Crash is the particular virtue of of describing a universal aspect of financial capitalism, which is both its instability and the immense follies that uh, characterize people who rise to the top in that world. And that story since is about the 1929 crash, but the essential elements of it come round again and again, including most recently in 2007, 2009. So this is a clearly a major body of work. And uh, he was the most widely read, certainly American economist of the, I would say, of the 20th century, and possibly the most widely read in the world. And certainly, while Keynes was more uh, influential in the profession, considered to be fundamental to the to the mid 20th century's way of thinking on these questions. Uh, he was not nearly as widely read around the world as my father was. James, over the last number of decades, we can see uh, how the economies have uh, have progressed. I, I wouldn't even say use the word progress, sorry, but what next for the economy? Because are we heading into one where there's larger inequality, which is the main focus of your particular readings and writings at the moment? Well, I've been working on this question, and I take a very, let's say, even lowbrow approach to it. My concern over quite a few years has been to develop credible 
measures of inequality that can be used effectively to make comparisons through time and across countries so that we can build a reasonably accurate picture at the global scale of how inequalities have evolved and what the relative relationships are uh, across space. Uh, and I think uh, that my approach, which is based upon a readily available data sources, administrative data sources, and a common sense and very, um, very uh, accessible method of calculating the inequality measures, has had a lot of success in, do, in achieving that objective. Uh, so that's uh, just by way of introducing your listeners to uh, the, what I've been up to. The, the work is under the rubric of something called the University of Texas Inequality Project. Yes. It's been carried out by my graduate students over a little more than 20 years now. Uh, so what have, what have we found? We found that, it, that, that our measures of inequality had one period of an enormous upward sweep, roughly from the, well, almost precisely from 1980, 81 until 2000. And the reasons are very clear when you just examine both the time, the, the timing and the geographic pattern of that change. Uh, this is the, the effect of global financial uh, developments. The debt crisis of the early 1980s, uh, which affected many countries of the developing world in a most uh, in a harsh and brutal way. Uh, the collapse at the end of the 1980s of the, of the socialist governments of Central Europe, the USSR, uh, which was itself partly a question of their inability to meet their external debts, going up through the Asian crisis of 1997. Uh, there's a peak in 2000. Uh, which coincides with the uh, uh, the boom of the, uh, the the peak of the Nasdaq boom, uh, and of course the 9/11 attacks and other events, which brought interest rates down and which led to a period of uh, broadly in the world actual improvement in inequality because uh, of the growth of, among other things, the, the growth of the demand from China for for commodities. Uh, and you have a period from 2000 until 2014 or 15 when there is uh, stabilization across many parts of the world. So uh, what we get from that in a nutshell is that the control of rising inequality is substantially a matter of better global financial governance aimed at providing poor countries and poor people, better chances uh, to uh, improve their living conditions uh, and to improve their relative incomes. And those that, that requires uh, policies to that effect, uh, as well as policies that control and stabilize the more rapacious tendencies of people and countries which live at the top of the income distribution, uh, who tend to be quite predatory on the, uh, the weaker and more vulnerable people and places. So that's 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 in essence where we are. So um just just to get a sense of this when you were saying that um there was kind of stability in the inequality over that 2000-2014 period. Yeah, if you go from 2000 to 2014 or so, you look at China, you can look at Russia, you can look at uh, much of Latin America uh and you're going to find and indeed I think uh, South Asia as well, you're going to find that the inequality measures uh, stabilize. They're still they're high by comparison to where they were in the 60s and 70s, uh, but they aren't still going up. And the reason they aren't is that there was this period of uh, stronger growth and better commodity prices uh, in the poorer countries. Inequality isn't that bad, is it, when you have a growing economy like well, China or India? Well, the... You know, it's a feature. Inequality is, of course, a feature of life. You can't escape from it. It's not there's no society which has achieved or nor would you want to live in a society which attempted to achieve a perfect equalization. That's, uh, you know, obvious. But the uh, so to say it's not bad. The point about inequality is that you want to keep it under control. Mm -hmm. You don't want it to rise uh, indefinitely. Uh, and you want to have a. Uh, a, a world in which uh, people know that there are limits to both the accumulation of extreme wealth and the uh, uh, risk of falling into into real penury. And it's the societies that maintain those limits and keep the measure of inequality at reasonable within reasonable bounds that tend to be the most successful over time. If this index that you've created, the University of Texas 
inequality. Yeah, University of Texas inequality project. As well. Yeah. So if you found over the next couple of years that if this inequality began to diverge and there was kind of an almost a larger differential between the higher 25 and lower 25 percent or maybe the one percent and the 10 percent on the bottom would this be somewhat correlated with instability in the economy well that's certainly something that we have looked into and what we find is that increased measures of inequality are in fact a sign uh, that you're heading into an unstable period and why is that because they tend to be generated by credit cycles by increasing uh, lending and uh, and, and by by increasingly reckless lending, well, that leads it ultimately, as we discovered in 2007, to a credit crash. So it's it's a uh, the accumulation of excessive uh, income in the hands of the very wealthiest people is a warning sign of impending problems. It's very much like the you know your blood pressure. It, you may not be symptomatic when your blood pressure starts to rise, but the problem is that you may be heading toward a heart attack or a stroke. That's a the parallel, I think, is really quite good. Because I'm living in Ireland, I can relate to maybe some social problems that we're having at the moment. With the, For example, with the housing crisis from 2008, we sold off a lot of our properties or bank loans to venture funds. And they, at the moment, they probably own about 30% of property here in Ireland. And mm-hmm. rent, because of the scarcity then, and the rent rents, as you know, based on that, is going to rise. But you have these social problems whereby housing is quite limited. People are staying at home till they're, you know, in their twenties, maybe even late twenties and thirties. Um, they're paying higher rents. Student accommodation is so, so much more expensive compared to in the past. I know, I know there's inflationary pressures as well, but this has gone pretty much way beyond it. And we are, if you look at that one variable in the economy, there's a large degree of inequality that has been, I'm sure, is quite evident. And perhaps that's related to the finance and maybe the debt combination. I, I think I think that's very much pointing at the, uh, you know, the correct way of analyzing this question. That the, These uh, are issues which develop uh, because of the, let's say, extension of credit in a reckless manner, which happened in Ireland in the period before the crisis. You then find, find a property bust uh, occurs and people can't afford to keep up their debt payments, so they lose their homes. So they have to basically they have them foreclosed or they sell out or they, 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 they evacuate them. Uh, and as a result, the homes end up, uh, the assets end up accumulating uh, in the hands of small numbers of people, including hedge funds, private e- equity, and so on and so forth. And they end up renting back and become an, a, basically an extractive force and reduce the a population which previously had the security of a you know, substantial physical asset, uh, an owned home, into renters. Uh, and renters are intrinsically vulnerable people. James, you're in Iceland. Iceland fared quite differently. They reacted differently to the crisis to Ireland. I, I, Iceland maintained its uh, its independence. It did not have, uh, did not uh, buckle onto the pressure that came from the UK uh, and from Holland uh, when its bank, when the corruption of its banks were exposed. And unlike Ireland, where it was, uh, it was wasn't it Monsieur Trichet who said a bomb will go off in Dublin uh, if you don't rescue the Anglo-Irish bank. Mm. Yes, the situation in Iceland uh, was was difficult for a period of time, but it was stabilized much more quickly uh, and they were able to recover much more effectively. Um, would that be an example of a, a free market economy rather than the intervention or would you feel intervention is important in certain situations? I know you can't generalize it, but in, in isolation. Yeah, I'm not a fan of this concept that there's such a thing as an economy without intervention. A functioning economy is it has a private sector uh, which operates under a regulatory framework. Uh, that's what we call rule of law, and that's exactly the same thing as a as a car which operates with a engine, but also requires a radiator, oil in the crankcase, air in the tire, other uh, and something to monitor to make sure that the air is in the tires. Uh, these are regulatory mechanisms, and I do not recommend driving your car without them. They tend to break down very quickly. Likewise, if you're my age, you 
it's useful to keep taking your blood pressure medicine because those are regulatory uh, processes which need to be maintained or otherwise you're going to run into problems. And if you let a banking system operate without regulation, there is no mechanism that's going to protect from massive frauds, from self-dealing, from uh, corruption of various kinds, and from predatory activities that are going to reduce the uh, the, the borrowing, the, the vulnerable part of your population to penury. And that's, of course, what you see happening. And, and I have a good familiarity with the situation in Greece, and I can assure you it's as bad there as it gets, uh, where you have essentially an entire national policy which is being run uh, as a debt collection process, as a, uh, as a re- repossession of assets process, uh, as a process which is, involves the dumping of valuable public assets onto the market at very low prices so they can be picked up by creditors from other places. Your recent book, Welcome to the Poison Chalice, The Destruction of Greece and the Future of Europe, it's a very intriguing uh, title. And in this, you reflect on what could be considered an avoidable economic catastrophe. And is that the case for um, Greece? Could it have been avoided? Well, the, the phrase "Welcome to the Poison Chalice" is actually something that the finance minister Yanis Varoufakis said to me uh, on the moment I arrived, uh, and oh. at his offices in Syntagma Square at the start of the uh, of of his four or five month tenure as the minister of finance uh, in Greece, uh, and it reflects uh, the reality that we knew at the time, which is that the we were under intense pressure. The Greek government was in intense pressure to conform to buckle uh, to the demands of its creditors and that those, these demands had nothing to do with restoring the Greek economy or uh, with helping the welfare of the Greek people, everything to do with the politics of, of, of satisfying the, the – of, of, first of all, main, uh, rescuing the, the, the banks of France and Germany and secondly, sta- stabilizing and satisfying the creditor interests in those countries and other countries of Northern Europe. Uh, so we were looking at what was intrinsically very hostile and very uh, unproductive from the Greek point of view of to economic policy. Could it have been avoided? Yes. Uh, there should never have been the original devil's bargain of 2010 uh, when Greece became essentially the pass-through uh, entity for a vast loan from the taxpayers of Europe to the bankers of France and Germany. That was the uh, the essence of what what happened, and the liability for the debt ended up on the backs of largely on the backs of of, of Greek taxpayers. Uh, so uh, this was what we called extend and pretend, uh, and make a new loan and, uh, and pretend it's going to be paid when you know it it is not going to be paid. That is a formula for perpetual perpetuating economic stagnation uh, and eventually of course the basic destruction of the social fabric of the country the core social institutions education health care transportation all get run down it's very hard to run a business because you're Taxes are very high. Your margins are very, very low uh, if you have any possibility of making a profit at all. Uh, and uh, people who are younger and have any capacity to to do so will go work elsewhere, will leave the country. And Greece is already suffering a substantial uh, population migration, out-migration as a result of that. And once you're once your 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 productive younger people leave, and, and you, the situation becomes more and more untenable over time. Uh, so that's the situation facing Greece. Europe has, in fact, taken one of its member countries and made an example of it for political reasons uh, in order to scare other countries and other voters in other countries. Uh, and to me, this is uh, a form of, if you like, collective punishment. And I'm not saying that the, that the Greek governments of the past, uh, which were Base, often in the hands of self-dealing and corrupt elites, elites are not responsible. They clearly are, uh, but the function of the of a political union is to look out at, for the welfare of its members, not not to uh, Im, not to teach moral lessons or to impose a particular politics that happens to serve one constituency at the expense of another. Uh, and that's clearly what we're seeing in Europe. Unfortunately, I remember the situation quite well, you know, as if it was only the other day. And I was quite personally, I was quite critical of what was going on. It was like as if um, Germany and France, you know, they, they felt collectively that you couldn't have 
their banks collapsing or their economy collapsing because of the bad debts or you know the bad debts from say Ireland or Greece or any of the other peripheral country, uh, countries in Europe. So the penalties were yeah, impo- you're, you're, yeah, and you're, you're you're breaking up a little bit, but let me just say, can you hear me? I can hear you clearly. Okay, good. Uh, let me just say that that the German and the French governments and the international agencies of that time, including the European Commission, the European Central Bank, and the International Monetary Fund, uh, knew very well that their policy that they were imposing would not work at, to improve the Greek economy. The, the staff of the IMF and other executive directors of the IMF said so in May of 2010. They knew very well that they had the technical means to rescue their own banks, but they did not want to take political responsibility for that. So they cooked up the scheme in which loans were made to Greece and immediately used to repay the uh, debts held by the banks, effectively transferring the debts from the banks to the taxpayers of of Europe. And it then becomes very hard for any elected government, say Chancellor Merkel's government in Germany, to admit to those taxpayers that that they are not going to get repaid. Uh, And especially hard for the governments of smaller countries, some of which are poorer than Greece and Slovakia, for example, who became creditors of Greece, but to say, oh, well, you made the Greeks a loan, and guess what? We knew that they were not going to be able to repay it. So you end up in a position where, unlike an ordinary commercial debt rescheduling and renegotiation or bankruptcy, uh, they, they, you have this political barrier to acknowledging that the, the thing was a catastrophic mistake or a catastrophically misconceived policy. Uh, and now the payment the, the, the payment comes due because there are bigger countries. There is in particular one bigger country, which is uh, can see very clearly what happened and isn't willing to go down to accept the same treatment, and that's Italy. Uh, and the, the confrontation that is now building between the Italian government, uh, which is a government of uh, a so-called populists, mostly right-wing populists, but still, is uh, quite determined, uh, appears to be quite determined not to accept the same dictation of economic policy from Brussels at the expense of the people who elected it. Uh, And so we are going to see the the escalation of tensions in Europe over this question. Uh, Italy is not a country you can push around. It's 20% of the Eurozone. That's the thing. Like I was surprised Italy got off the hook, if you want to say that, because of the large population that it has and maybe um, the the passion that the the population would have that they could destabilize the area. I know the Greeks went uh, on strikes uh, on a lot of strikes. Irish didn't, and I I was ag- again surprised that the IMF. I think it was the IMF tried to suggest to Greece that they should sell off their ports and you know make them all privatized. Well, the the the, the privatization of the port of Piraeus was to it a Chinese firm uh, it was done, I think, in a quite constructive way mm. that involved a, the kinds of things that you would want to see, uh, an agreement on investment in modernizing the facilities and an agreement on the treatment of the of maintenance of workers' rights and so forth. But it, the privatization of the Greek regional airports was carried out in a way uh, which was just to maximize the benefit to the creditors. They only sold the ones that were profitable. The ones that were not profitable were still left with the Greek state. And then you have pressure to privatize the power companies and the water company, everything practically uh, that is uh, private that can be sold. Even Even historic sites are on the list for privatization. And that's that in, is is uh, really quite indefensible from a from a even a constitutional standpoint with respect to the, the to uh, to Greece. So you're looking you're looking at what is essentially asset stripping, asset seizures, as a way of again a way of asserting the interests of the creditors uh, in this matter. Um, there were also uh, I could go on and the list is quite long of uh, ways in which. Uh, the political interests of uh, wealthy and powerful European uh, forces were imposed on Greece under the pretext of, of so-called economic reforms, which had no reasonable relationship 
to the improvement of the Greek economy. People need to be very clear. The word reform is thrown around here, but it does not mean that it's something which is intended to benefit the, the entity which is being reformed. We have to remember that Greece is a, a different type of economy. It's more of a, a tourist-dependent economy. And but it's true up to a point. Tourism is about 20% of the Greek economy, but there are also uh, and have been industries. Uh, there still uh, was still a, 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 a three or four years ago a viable pharmaceutical interest industry, for example, in Greece. And there are others. Shipping is a major industry in Greece. Before Greece joined the European Union, uh, it had a substantially larger uh, industrial sector. There were, in fact, some automobiles that were made in Greece as well. But over the period of integration with the European economy, it has become largely deindustrialized and much more dependent on tourism. Uh, and tourism is an industry with, you know, which has saturation limits. There's only so much you can do, even in a country that is as beautiful and uh, uh, extensive as, as Greece is. Uh, you can't make uh, a kind of extended development out of tourism. Uh, so you need to think about what the Greek economy can do as how it can be positioned in Europe as a, uh, as, a, as a center for other things as well. And that's what we were trying to do in 2015, to have a vision about how, uh, how one can develop the cultural industries, could develop the educational industries, one could develop health and retirement in Greece as industries. But to do that, you need to have resources and you need to have investors and you need to have a clear prospect that you can you know, make a living doing this over a long period of time. And it, so long as you're mired in an incurable debt crisis, uh, nobody in their right mind is going to going to make those kinds of investments. Because the long-term strategy, it, it appears right now bleak. I, I don't know what it's like in Greece, um, to be honest, uh, unless progress being made. But with the population depletion of young people emigrating, then you have your, your shipping is one of your most important industries and you've given up a lot of your ports or you've sold off some of your ports maybe to... to yeah, just, let's be careful about sh the shipping is a global industry. Uh, most of the ships never touch Greece. They're, they're headquartered there, and that's a historic... But there's some revenue will be generated from that, would there be? There, there's some. It's not... Uh, it's, uh, it's not like the Panama Canal or anything? <laughs> no, it's not like the Panama Canal. I mean, the, the, the problem of taxing shipping is that the capital asset is a ship. It sits out there on the wide ocean, and it can easily be reflagged to some other country. So you, there's a limit to how much effective taxation you can do. But there's some benefit to the country, nevertheless, or at least it's thought that there is, in having the headquarters operations and the, uh, you know, maintaining the, the nominal ownership of the, of, of the shipping firm. In Greece. If we didn't have the League of Nations, you probably wouldn't have the European Union. And if this was like 100 years ago, would you think it would have been a totally different outcome? Would you think the countries would be invading each other? Would the UK invade Iceland or the Netherlands? Would would do the same? Could you, you know, Greece could have decided not to make repayments and be, in a way, if you were, it's probably the wrong word, being stubborn about it, you could have consequences, military consequences. Well, I think the history of the European wars tells you that, that yes, indeed, uh, the last century was not exactly uh, one of, um, uh, say, light and harmony. But I think it's also fair to say that, that that period has passed and is not going to come again, that it would have been quite possible and highly proper. Uh, for the European community to behave like a community and to look at this problem from a realistic point of view. And their refusal to do that is uh, one which is now threatening the viability of, of, of the European Union, certainly of the Eurozone. One of the things I'm, I'm still working with, with Yanis Varoufakis on the project of, of trying to reform ideas and institutions and policies in Europe um, through something we, that is called the Democracy in Europe movement, which is aiming to make a stand in the 2019 European parliamentary elections. And the idea here is that uh, we do not accept the notion that Europe should be broken up precisely because that plays into the hands of right-wing extremism 
plays into the hands of xenophobia, plays into the hands of the degradation of human rights, and ultimately it's not economically productive either. So what actually needs to happen is to have a thoroughgoing reform of the governing institutions uh, to break them out of this uh, mindset, which is basically dooming uh, the future prospects of Europe and create a kind of progressive reform, which uh, has uh, some parallels uh, with the experience the United States went through in the 1930s, which uh, came to be known as the New Deal. So the economic program that we've been uh, developing and advocating is called the European New Deal. Uh, not so much to uh, say to so certainly not uh, to imitate what was done in the U.S., but the, it makes it a reference to a, a broad similarity uh, in that what you need to do uh, is to have a program that's suited to the problems that we face now, the problems of climate change, problems of uh, the need for renovating investment, and the problems of the need to stabilize the uh, human situation across the most crisis-ridden countries of Europe uh, in a way that strengthens unity rather than destroys it. Your father worked with Leontief and um, James Tobin or um, collaborated with them in terms of visiting China and uh, I think it was in the 1970s and they found right. uh, the high growth is is expected based on, the, you know, they anticipated the rise of China. Well, I wouldn't I wouldn't go that far. They This, they were but what was interesting about that trip, which occurred very shortly after the um, uh, opening to China uh, in the early 1970s, the fact that the Chinese were interested in these particular people. Uh, uh, Leontief, not a surprise, because he had actually worked in China in, the 19, in 1929, uh, helping the design of railways. Uh, but uh, that they were interested in my father was extremely interesting, and I later discovered and realized that uh, this had to do with the fact that they had made a very careful study of my father's work, but especially not, not only his academic work, and, but also his work in the U.S. government in the 1940s when he was responsible for stabilizing prices during the Second World War. Uh, and this played into something that the Chinese – leadership understood very well, which is that their population was extremely adverse to instability and particularly the instability that we call inflation. And so they were very interested in making contact with my father on that ground. Uh, and I, I think that the fact that they pursued, if you like, a Galbraithian line, and I think there's a lot of evidence that that's in fact what they did, I think helped China not to have, not to be subject to the kinds of of debt cycles and instabilities and crises uh, after reforms began to happen in 1976 or so that uh, have other countries have experienced, or if they when they did have problems as they did in 18, 1989 uh, to change course and to stay in a stabilizing way as quickly as possible. Uh, and I had some experience in China in the 1990s, which reinforced this view. So I think, in fact, you can say that not only China, but other countries which maintained the general worldview that my father articulated have done comparatively well. And the two others I would mention, Germany and Japan. Mm -hmm. The United States, the UK, on the other hand, uh, turned everything over to financial capital and experienced the uh, a kind of both the deindustrialization and the instability that result. And the result of that has been, among other things, in the UK, the Brexit vote, and in the United States, the rise of, of Donald Trump. Your um, position as a, a progressive economist, would your influences be similar to those of um, James Tobin on his look at the Tobin well, tax? Jim Tobin was a professor of mine, and we had okay. some, uh, we mainly discussed policy matters. When I was at Yale in the middle 1970s, I was working also at the same time on Capitol Hill on monetary policy. And of course, Tobin was the author of this proposal for a financial transactions task, tax, and, and we certainly shared the view that the financial sector should not be allowed to, to be the, the, the dominating force in a political economy. You have to have it. It's, it's, it should be a service entity, uh, one which, which supports both industrial development, but also the larger social institutions. Uh, it should not be the uh, the entity which sets the rules and runs the show because financial bankers are basically very dangerous people. 
if you allow them too much, uh, too much leeway. The regulated banking sector is essential. An unregulated one is catastrophic. So I think Jim Tobit and I certainly shared that view. It's some, something I would, I, would, I would take away from, in part from my association with him, but not only with him. Your uh, movement, uh, with, yeah, not your movement, but you're look, looking for a certain type of democracy in Europe or worldwide with Yanis. Could you anticipate some people attacking you from either the left or the right in terms of discrediting your policies and your approach because they may end up losing that political power, the dynasty that they would have once had? Oh, I'm certainly against dynasties, and so people who are in favor of dynasties, I would expect to be on the other side of any political debate. But I would point out that one of the, I think, less well-recognized um, policy innovations and enduring institutions in the United States is uh, the estate and gift tax, which is designed in the U.S. case to strongly favor people who make a lot of money in their lifetimes, giving it away before they uh, before they go to to uh, cross the pearly gates. And the effect of this is that uh, both a, a a culture of gifts to universities and to hospitals and foundations and cultural centers and so forth, uh, and a strong tax incentive backing up that culture and. This gives you a uh, a social sector which has a lot of decentralization, but which is in many cases quite in many ways quite robust and employs a large number of people, which is partly responsible for relatively good employment performance in the U.S. Uh, so it's much better to have a system like that. So it says that you, yes, of course, in a capitalist economy, we are going to have accumulations of wealth, but don't let them be passed on to to children and grandchildren who simply become rentiers, uh, who simply become, who, who use them to go into politics or to otherwise become oligarchs, uh, controlling things without having had the, uh, uh, you know, the merit of having accumulated them in the first place. Uh, and that seems to me to be a very useful way of, of dealing with the tendency of a capitalist economy to generate poles uh, you know, of great wealth to, to, to create uh, very successful industrial and financial entrepreneurs. Fine. Let them, let them be created, but don't let them continue to con- dominate the society uh, after, uh, you know, after a certain period of time. And after, certainly after they pass on, these re- resources should come back into, uh, into use as part of, of professionally managed public institutions, semi-public institutions. The U.S. seems to be going that way, doesn't it, with the number of presidents, well, the families, Bush, the Clintons? Trump. Well, that's exactly the problem. Is that we weaken this, and we and uh, they, the the Bush dynasty is just one example of how a uh, dynastic political entity decays over time. The, uh, that's that's of course very clear. The but the, but it's not the only example. There's, there was a there's a a nation, perhaps a Trump dynasty. There certainly was a nation. Romney dynasty didn't get very far. Well, and actually, father, son, grand, and then uh, did, it came to an end. But they, you know, one could go down the list, and, and not, not, not the, the Democratic side's not exempt either. Some fairly obvious names come to mind: Roosevelt, Kennedy. Yeah. But it was Teddy Roosevelt who initiated the tax on estates and gifts, and this was, a, you know, very far-sighted and sensible thing, and it's done an enormous amount of good in American society over a century. Can I ask you another? Quick questions before we wrap up, James. Sure. Is there any book that you'd like to recommend, say, someone who's maybe interested in your work on inequality? Uh, obviously, your own books that we mentioned today, I'll have a list of, of, of them on my uh, website, economicrockstar.com forward slash James Galbraith. Mm-hmm. But if there's um, a book that could introduce a student to this type or anybody to, to this type of reading. Well, my the book I published most recently on inequality is a little Oxford Press book called Inequality, What Everyone Needs to Know. Uh, and that is specifically designed to cover, you know, the range of, 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 of basics that uh, I think students can most usefully learn to give them a kind of foundation in this area. Uh, so that's, that's I guess, the, for my own work, that's the one I would, I would recommend. Lots of other 
people have done different things in this area. Uh, I'm, of course, I'm an admirer of my friend Branko Milanovic, uh, who works on inequality across people across mm-hmm. the whole planet. Uh, and I, I think his work is also very interesting. It's quite different from mine, but it, uh, there he has a number of books that uh, uh, that touch on these issues that uh, I think provide a useful useful perspective. If you could time travel and step into the DeLorean, what era would you like to go back to and who would you like to meet? Oh, hmm. oh I suppose uh, I would like to go back to the neighborhood I grew up in in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the late 1800s, which was populated by the Cambridge philosophers, Charles Saunders Peirce, uh, uh, William James, who developed the traditions of pragmatism and pluralism that I find very interesting. But I don't really have to do that because Louis Menon wrote a very good book called The Metaphysical Club, uh, which can take you back there uh, uh, without any of the uh, general discomforts of living in the late 19th century, which I would not nice. myself personally care to experience. Yeah. Metaphysical experience, is it? Or? Metaphysical club. It's really Metaphysical great. club. Yeah. Um, do you have anything that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Maybe um, say something that could be based on our discussion today to sum up or any advice? I'm uh, certainly not prepared to give your listeners any any uh, advice, uh, at, but uh, I do think that this is a crucial moment for all Europeans in particular and that uh, – thinking very hard about the political choices that come up uh, coming up next year uh, in the European context is extremely important. So I recommend that they familiarize themselves with the, with the principles of the European New Deal and see if they find them uh, congenial. Great. James, Obviously. thanks very much for spending time with me. Um, I'll have all the links, books and resources that we discussed here in this episode over at economicrockstar.com forward slash James Galbraith. Uh, thanks again, and you are an economic rock star. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. All the best then, James. Okay. Uh, thanks a million, and I'll talk to you soon. I really appreciate it, James. Okay, my pleasure. Cheers. All the best. Bye. Bye. Economic Rockstar is a free podcast that does not exclude anyone from listening as long as they have a device to listen, download or stream. I have many listeners from all parts of the world and I truly am pleased to know that the Economic Rockstar podcast unites all of you through the common theme of economics. I strive to commit to releasing an episode each week and aim to develop Economic Rockstar into much more than just a podcast. Patreon is a platform that gives you, the listener of the Economic Rockstar podcast, the opportunity to express your appreciation of the show by committing a financial reward for as little as $1 a month. Patreon allows me, the creator of the Economic Rockstar podcast, to be rewarded and paid by you so I can continue with the running costs of the show and to reinvest and expand the podcast into other platforms or mediums in the future. To find out more on how you can help the Economic Rockstar podcast and have your name added to the supporters list on my website, please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar or visit the supporters page on the Economic Rockstar website. If you enjoyed this podcast, why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economicrockstar.com where you can also sign up and be a member of the Economic Rockstar community. If you're listening to this episode on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, I would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review, as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it. If you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com, make sure you check out the back catalogue of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now.